Well, hey everybody and welcome online. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. We've got such an exciting service planned. Absolutely. Pastor Andre is doing part two of the series that he started last week and we're so excited to hear about that. And as always, our Kids On team has prepared fantastic ministry for your little ones. So if you've got another device, be sure to get them logged on so that they don't miss out. And don't forget, you still have time to invite someone to the service. Send them a link. Uh, use the YouTube link if you want to, however you can get them there because the stream might just change their life as we worship together, which is what we're going to do right now. So maybe you want to get some space in your, in your lounge or in your bedroom. Let's press in, let's trust God and let's keep hope alive. Amen. Our God is for us and His love will never leave us. Come on, we're celebrating. Let's praise Him together with one voice. God, our freedom.
thank you, Lord, that you are here with us, Lord. Your love is with us, God. And you keep our hope alive in every circumstance. We worship you, Lord. We pour out our hearts to you. What gift of love could I offer to a king?
God. Thank you, God. Lord, we pour our hearts to you, God. We worship and adore you, Lord. And as we do so, God, I pray that you will bless every family, God. And that your presence will fill every home, God. We look to you, Lord, as we worship. Hope is in you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We sing. The Lord bless you.
Well, hello, church. I hope that singing this song today has done something for your soul as you remind yourself the way that we can approach God and what God's heart is towards us. Now, the words of this song come from Numbers chapter 6, and it's the priestly blessing. And I want us to go through that today because this forms the basis of the way that we approach God and His heart towards us. It says, the Lord bless you. Church, we should expect blessing from God, blessing for our families, blessing for our children, blessing in our workplace, blessing for our colleagues, blessing for every area of our lives. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord keep you healthy. The Lord keep you strong. The Lord keep you protected. The Lord keep your family together. The Lord keep you full of joy when there's anxiety around you. The Lord keep you lifted up when you're filled with depression. The Lord keep you financially in every area of your lives. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. You know, when my face is shining upon my kids, they can see the fullness of my love. They can see the fullness of my approval of them. They can see the fullness of my belief in them. When God's face shines upon us, we know He's not looking at the sins of the past. He's not looking at the mistakes of today, but He's looking at the hope for the future because He is gracious towards us. He's not up in heaven grumpy and mean and bearing down on us. No, He's gracious towards us. He lifts us up when we fail. He strengthens us when we are weak. It goes on to say, may the Lord turn His face towards you. It means that He is attentive to every detail of our lives. He's heard every cry, church. He knows every pain. He's observant of every single struggle that we go through and He cares about every single one of those. And because He is such a close and attentive God, He wants to give us peace, that no matter what is happening around us, no matter the circumstances that we are faced with, we can have peace in the midst of a storm. So church, this will be our prayer today. So whatever it is that you're going through in your family, with your health, with your finances, with your work, let's come together with our needs before the Lord and trust that He will help us today. Our dear Father, we thank you so much that you will bless us, that you will keep us. Lord, thank you that your face does shine upon us. Lord, thank you that you are gracious to us, that you've turned your face towards us and that we can stand here today expecting your peace. I pray for every single person, no matter what it is that they're going through. And Lord, we know that the challenges of people in church are vast and difficult. I pray for families, for marriages, for finances, for business, for health, for fears, anxieties, worries for the future that you would show yourself faithful. Lord, we pray that you would provide. I pray that you would give peace to turmoil. I pray you give strength to weakness. And I pray, Father God, for every single need represented by an aching heart today, that your goodness would shine through, that we would praise you for the good work that you have done. We thank you, Lord, in expectation for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. The National Coronavirus Command Council has decided to enforce a nationwide lockdown. Mysterious pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan, China. A new type of coronavirus. Grave diggers find little rest in this cemetery in the port city of Cape Town. This is going to get worse before it 10 gets million better. workers now applying for unemployment. 50 million unemployment. Zoom claims. after Zoom can be exhausting. Where does South Africa stand after the year that and we've now had? now to South Africa, which has been battling to contain a mutant strain. And there's little hope. There's a lot happening around us. There's a, a lot of negativity, but thank God that He's still on the throne of our lives. And thank God that Jesus is still in control. Of all things. It's easy, especially in the season, for other things to take center stage. But if you and I are going to keep hope alive, it needs to be Jesus. But we have to lift our eyes to the Lord and remember that we always have hope and that our suffering is not our final story. Jesus called us to be light in this dark world. And if our light bulb is not plugged into Jesus, our light will not shine. Everything is shaking around us. Things are collapsing, but we will not be moved. We keep hope alive. We know God's got something in mind. We know we are secure in Christ because we have a hope in the Father.
Well, how exciting is that? Our next prayer meeting coming up this Wednesday evening. We can't wait to see you, your family, and your friends online across our different campuses because prayer is a value at Rivers Church. It really is a value. You know, we have many values, and one of the, the most important values is reaching people. So if you're here for the first time, we just want to give you a huge welcome. Maybe somebody shared a link with you. Maybe somebody's watching church online in one of the other rooms. Maybe you saw something online in the week. We're so glad that you joined us here today. We believe that God has a plan for your life and you're not here by accident. We want to help you along this journey. So we've put together some information in a visitor's brochure online. If you click the tab, you can grab that. But there's also a way to connect with us because we want to connect with you. You can fill in your details and one of our team will be in touch. And maybe today you're joining us online because you weren't able to book a seat at our Centurion or Belito campus. It's great that you're joining us online. Hopefully you'll get a chance next week. Maybe uh, you're still not feeling safe with COVID or you've got a comorbidity. It's great that we can still connect online. Absolutely. And you know, there's always something so exciting happening in the life of the church. And sisters, just a reminder that we've got our next meeting on the 26th of March. So be sure to diarize that and invite all the sisters in your world. And of course, our youth and young adults are continuing to meet on Fridays. You know, just like the ladies meet on a Friday, youth and young adults actually happens every single Friday. So if you're in the age group, and that's uh, youth is uh, grade eight to matric, or maybe you've matriculated in your 19 to 25, why not join us online? It's a great way to connect with people in, your, in the same sort of sphere as life. Uh, we have Zoom Connects, and we get to connect in the comments. It's a great way to spend a Friday. We can't wait to see you there online. Absolutely. Church, we are so excited because next weekend we've got a fantastic guest speaker, Pastor Jonathan Fontana Rosa. He's from Edge Church in Adelaide. He's got an amazing word on his heart and we can't wait to be blessed by that. I believe there are people who are going to come unstuck today, people who are going to make a decision today to say, I'm no longer going to live in the barrenness of my 38 years. No, I'm not going to stay in my wilderness. No, I'm not going to stay without vision. No, I'm not going to stay dry and barren. I'm going to step into the promise that God has for me. Well, as we come around our giving today, I wanna to encourage you to take a moment to consider the various ways in which you can give. And if you haven't downloaded it yet, SnapScan is a really safe and convenient option. You know, we were cleaning up around the house a few weeks back. It's something that we do at the start of every new year. We, we like to remove all the clutter and, and give away what we don't need. Well, when we were sorting through my daughter's room, we found some old puzzle pieces and we weren't quite sure what puzzle they belong to. So naturally, I just wanted to throw them away. To be honest, I've never really been a big fan of puzzles. I get frustrated, I get bored. Some people can sit down and put 5,000 pieces together. It's actually quite amazing. But what I do know about puzzles is that when you're putting those little pieces together, pieces that almost look random on their own, much like the pieces I found in my daughter's room, it's essential to keep your eyes on the big picture. You see, every puzzle comes with a box or it comes with a picture and it's almost impossible to put that puzzle together if you don't keep looking at it. You know, it's the same when it comes to our giving. Each of us has something in our hand to give. It's like a piece of the puzzle, but when we look at it out of context, it can seem random and almost pointless, especially in the season. But when you and I keep looking at the bigger picture, the fact that there are needs that need to be met, people who need to be helped and pointed to Jesus, the fact that even though the building is closed, that we're still the church and through church online, we're able to feed people spiritually and keep hope alive. When we look at that bigger picture, we can bring our puzzle piece knowing that it can still make a big difference. You know, in John 6, we read about a large crowd that gathered to hear Jesus teach. And Jesus tells the disciples to feed the people, but they're not quite sure what to do until a boy comes forward with his lunch. John 6 and verse 8, it says, Andrew, the disciple who was Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. I met a young boy in the crowd carrying five barley loaves and two fish, but that is practically useless in feeding a crowd this large. You know, that's pretty accurate when we look at things in the natural. But the boy puts his lunch in the hands of Jesus and Jesus multiplies it and feeds 15,000 people. Plus, there were leftovers. 
You see, that boy saw the bigger picture, not just his own needs. He could have agreed with Andrew and said, yes, it's pointless, I'll just eat this lunch myself. Instead, he understood that his puzzle piece was vital. And as a result, the crowd was fed, and listen, he was fed. He never lost out because he gave. So as we give today, let's keep our eyes on the bigger picture and remember that when we put our puzzle piece in God's hands, He is able to multiply it and meet our needs as well as the needs of others. Well, I hope that encourages you in your giving today. The various ways to give are gonna come up on the screen now, but let's take a moment to pray and commit our giving to the Lord. Father, we thank You that You are our provider, that in Your hands, our piece of the puzzle isn't random or useless, but vital. I pray that as we sow today, that You would multiply our seed and meet every need. Bless each and every giver, I pray. In Jesus' Name, Amen, Amen. Well, church, it's that time to get around the Word again, and I'm eager to get to part two. So why don't you pray with me today, and let's believe God to speak to us and to reveal truth to us today. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would reveal truth to your people, that you'd speak into our hearts and show us what truth is. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Because he didn't know what truth was. And you released a criminal and bound the truth. And I pray today that the truth would be set free, that you would speak to our hearts and illuminate the truth in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, last week we looked at that question that the Lord asked Jeremiah, what do you see? And this week we're going to look at the question that Jesus asked his disciples on two occasions, what do you think? Such an important question. And what he's really saying as he asks that is, how do you think on this matter? Do you think like the world thinks or do you think like I think? Because wrong thinking leads to wrong decisions and wrong living. And there's a big difference between conventional seeing and conventional thinking and biblical seeing and biblical thinking. So let's read from Matthew chapter 17 and verse 24. And it says, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He's asking him, let me know how you think on this matter. He asked, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Very interesting question. Jesus here gives himself the status of a king and he gives the children of God status of children of the kingdom. And what he's saying is we think differently to the political systems and the ways of the world and the way the world operates because Jesus is our king and we are the king's children and so we adopt kingdom thinking not political or natural thinking. We live in the political and natural world, but we adopt kingdom thinking. And Jesus says to Peter, what do you think? Because he wants him to think kingdom, not naturally. And it's very important for us to realize that our lives will always move in the direction of our thoughts. How you think is where you will end up. If you're fearful, you'll end up with fear. And that's why the modern environmental movement has created fear in people and a reality through thinking that is actually not correct. I want you to scan this QR code on the screen and you'll see 50 years of incorrect predictions about the environment and how none of them have come true. Don't you remember in 2008, it was Al Gore who said that in just five years, the polar ice caps would be completely gone. Well, they're still there. In 2009, Prince Charles also said that we've got eight years in which to save the world. You'll also remember how we had the discussion about the polar bears and how they were disappearing. Well, in 1960, there were 5,000. Today, there are 25,000. So rather than going extinct and us living in fear, actually things are not as bad as they seem. But our thinking has been brainwashed to think a certain way about our planet, about our future, about oil, about business, about truth. In every area, if your thinking is incorrect, it creates an incorrect reality. 
Now, before I get into some areas that I really am eager to get into, I want to remind you of the Corinthian church. They thought of something a certain way, and as a result, it had power over them. And I see that happening in the world today because of the information that we're getting. People's thinking is not biblical, and so a false reality is being created. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and uh, Paul speaking to the Corinthians, he says, so then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world. In other words, it's a piece of stone. It's a piece of wood. It really has no power. Then he says, and that there is no God but one. He says, however, not all believers know this. In other words, there are Christians who've got wrong thinking. They think something is more powerful than it actually is. And he says, some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. You see how you think about something will determine its hold over you, will determine how you respond and what you believe. And so sound thinking and biblical thinking is extremely important. And God is asking us today in a number of very key areas as believers, what do you think? He asked Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah saw as God saw. Today we need to look and ask, what do you think? Is your thinking correct or is it incorrect in the very important areas of life? Remember, our thinking can only be changed, not by opinion, not by my opinion, but by the renewing of our minds, as it says in Romans 12, through the word of God. Let's look at several areas today. I hope to get through all of them that we need to ask ourselves, what do we think? Firstly, number one, what do you think about our origins? What do you think about our origins? Do you think we evolved or do you think we were created? Because what you believe about yourself and about where we come from will determine your behavior and the way you live and the way you view life, the way you view the earth and the way you view animals. And we see today that because people believe they evolved, they actually came from animals. Today we believe that we are less important than animals because animals were here before us. The earth was here for millions of years, then came along animals, and then we evolved out of animals. So who are we to have any kind of rights or any kind of rulership over the earth? The Lord said, have dominion, be fruitful, multiply. But today's thinking says, no, you came last. The chimps were here long before you. So you need to respect the chimps. And in fact, they say, if you think you're above animals, that's ego. If, if you think you're with the animals, that's eco. In other words, it's eco-friendly. But actually, Sanskrit goes further and says, no, you're right at the bottom of animals. You need to serve animals. And so our thinking determines how we view our world, whether we eat meat or not, whether we'll eat a hamburger again. It changes everything, and it all starts with our thinking about our origins. The premise is you don't deserve or have the right to develop the world's resources because you are a Jimmy come lately, they were here before you. In fact, it's very interesting, Sir David Attenborough, who does all the nature programs, he actually says this, humans are a plague on the earth that need to be controlled by limiting population growth. In other words, animals are more, and humans are a plague. That's completely opposite to the thinking of how the Bible portrays human beings. David Foreman, he's the leader of a group called Earth First. Listen to this. He says, when an organism multiplies without restraint, it is referred to as a biological nuisance. When cells grow out of control, it is a cancer. Within nature, people are a cancer upon the planet. Can you believe the thinking? But the thinking comes from us being evolved from animals. It's the natural result. Humans are devalued and animals are overvalued. This is not God's thinking. This is humanistic thinking. So what do you think about yourself and what do you think about human beings? Let me take you further. The, the lady who heads up the organization called PETA, and uh, that's people for the ethical treatment of animals, Ingrid Newkirk. She compares the Holocaust to chickens being slaughtered. She says six million Jews died in concentration camps, but six billion broiler chickens will die this year in slaughterhouses. It's absurd. We can't eat animals and it's likened to the Holocaust, but a lion can go out and tear a gazelle into a million pieces and chew it up. 
animals are given rights and humans have no rights and no accountability as well because we're just plasma that evolved and we come from the animals. You know, they say that we must have come from the chimpanzee because we share 98% of our DNA with the chimpanzee. So the logical reasoned thinking that is coming from people makes a lot of sense. However, we fail to remember that we share 50% of our DNA with a banana, but we never make that connection. No, but we make the connection with the animals and we devalue human beings. We need to remember that man is unique, he's created in the image of God, and we need to think about it like that, or it will change everything we believe about life, the use of the resources on the planet, the eating of meat, and the way we live and the way we develop. We are being halted in our progress today by well-meaning but distorted thinking people. And we need to get the truth of the word, realize man is completely unique on the planet, he does not descend from a chimpanzee. I love this book by R.C. Sproul called Are People Basically Good? And he says, evidently man is the only one of these 80 some varieties of primate that has a problem with nakedness. And therefore he has a problem with guilt. Man is the only creature in all of creation that has artificial garments. And the scriptures tell us that this is not to keep us warm, but to cover our shame. Man is not an evolved animal, God created him 63 times in the Bible. It tells us that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth and the creator of mankind. And so it's extremely important that we think correctly about this because there is distorted thinking. And if our foundation is wrong, we will believe a lie. Daniel Kahneman wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. He also got a Nobel Prize for economics. He said a reliable way of making people believe in falsehoods is frequent repetition because familiarity is not easily distinguished from truth. In other words, if you hear something enough times, you'll start to believe it. So what we think about our origins is extremely important because in Psalm 8 it says God made us a little lower than the angels, not a little lower than the animals. And if you think we just evolved, then you won't believe in God, you won't have accountability to God, and you will start protecting animals more than you protect human beings. I said it last week, birds have more protection than the unborn children in the womb of a woman in our world. Number two, here's another question. What do you think about truth? What do you think about truth? Is there such a thing as truth today? And Jesus said this, by the way, in John chapter 18. He says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Today, people say there's no such thing as truth. We don't evaluate truth through thinking. All our truth is evaluated through feeling. So when we feel something, that we determine to be our truth. So if we feel a certain way about ourselves, we determine I am a good person, I am fine, I don't need Jesus. As long as I feel that, that must be the truth but the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that there's absolute truth and absolute truth comes from God and cannot be determined by our feelings. George R.R. Martin wrote a book called The Clash of Kings. He's the author of The Game of Thrones. Many people would know him as the author. And in 1988, he said this. He said, people often claim to hunger for truth, but seldom like the taste of it when it is served up. Isn't that the truth? You see, we want truth and we say we hunger for it, but when it's served up, it's not palatable because we're living by feelings in our world. And this is what I've discovered. People no longer evaluate things by going to the Bible or by the truth of the matter. They go by what they call feelings, but here's the thing, compassion. So someone wants to get divorced. They don't say to them, man, you need to go get some counseling and go and seek some advice. No, you, you, know, you need to stick at it. No, they say, they say, I feel sorry for you. Shame. You're not happy, hey? And because you're not happy, shame. Yes, you need to get out of that marriage. So our compassion and our feelings determine what's true rather than what do we actually think about truth. We have to determine sexuality, marriage, relationships, commitments. Everything has to be determined by truth, not by feeling. When it comes to abortion today, we feel sorry, we feel compassion for the mother. Shame, she fell pregnant and now her whole career is going to be ruined. And this is what we say. We call a fetus a baby when we want it to be born. I'm having a baby. But when we don't want the baby to be born, suddenly we change the terminology. It's a fetus. 
No one ever says when a woman falls pregnant, how's your fetus doing? No, because we don't think of it like that until we want to destroy it. So we always determine our truth and our end product by our feelings. And the whole world today is governing truth by feelings. Let me remind you, if you don't believe in abortion, how come when we take fertilized eggs and we fertilize them with sperm in a laboratory and implant them into someone so that they can have a baby, how come we consider that life? But when a woman has a baby in her for three months, it's not considered life. You see, we don't think anymore. We feel and we determine truth by compassion and by feeling. And it seems so good, but actually we deny the truth of the Bible. Jonathan Haidt, who is a American psychologist, he says the emotional tail wags the rational dog. Anyone who values truth should stop worshiping reason. You see, if we can reason it away and feel it, then we determine it's true. And the emotional tail is wagging the rational dog. It's, it's the common philosophy that's had its roots long ago. And people like Friedrich Nietzsche said this, the uh, German philosopher, there are no facts, only interpretation. In other words, there's no such thing as truth. It's only how you see it and how you interpret it. And so we feel everything. Can I say this when it comes to multiple genders? Science says there are only two genders. Genesis says God created them male and female. But today we say there are more genders. It's not based on science, XX and XY. That's why we have men's and women's sport because there's vast differences in the makeup of a man and a woman. But we feel that we are another gender. So we say we're another gender and you have operations to change your gender. But the fact remains, the truth remains, there are only two genders. Feelings are determining the truth of our world not God's word. And you can say, well, you're raising terrible issues here and you're making people feel uncomfortable. Unfortunately, the church has been silent when it comes to truth. As a result, people don't know what truth is anymore and there's confusion. Paul writing to the Corinthians says, they're believers who think that idols are real. That's what's happening in our world today. And it all starts in the schools. I want to remind parents today, in your schools today, you're no longer taught morality or truth. You're taught feelings and information. That's why we've got bad kids coming out of good homes because morality is ignored. There's no such thing as right and wrong. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Only how you feel about your information. If you think education is the answer to everything, think again. Think as God thinks because it was highly educated people that were amongst the Nazis that were in the forefront of killing Jews. Highly educated people. It was highly educated people in Tokyo who gassed all those people in the subway. They all had degrees equivalent to Harvard and Yale. We need to think again when we think education is the answer. Thomas Sowell, who I hugely respect, and I say this every time I quote him, he said this. He says, the problem isn't that Johnny can't read. The problem isn't that even Johnny can't think. The problem is that Johnny doesn't know what thinking is. He confuses it with feeling. And so thinking and feeling have become synonymous and today we need to think as the Bible thinks. What do you think about truth today? What do you think about origins? Number three, I hope you're with me today and I hope you're thinking deeply. What do you think about right and wrong? Today, right and wrong is determined by human beings on the planet. When the Bible says right and wrong cannot be determined by sinful human beings because it will change according to their standards, according to their criteria, according to what they feel is right and wrong, and there is no way of establishing something basic that can govern humanity. The Ten Commandments came from heaven down to man because it's above us, and right and wrong has to be determined from above us, not from within us. What's morally wrong is morally wrong if God says it's morally wrong, not what man says, because what man says changes per era and with culture and fashion. Leo Tolstoy in his book, A Confession, said this. He says, wrong does not cease to be wrong because the majority share in it. Today, if everyone thinks a certain way, you're automatically wrong. No, we hold to Bible truth. And Jesus said, what do you think? It's time for the church to think about the way they think and to begin to see as God sees to begin to think as God thinks. Number four, what do you think about God? You say, well, that's a vast subject and it's a sub point in your message. Yes, this is the problem today. People think God is only one dimensional. God 
is love. Well, the Bible says that, but it doesn't mean that that is God to the exclusion of other characteristics. But it suits us today in the modern world to think that God is love. Oh no, God just loves, you see. So every decision you make must be made out of emotion and out of compassion. And, and so God is only a loving God. No, he's not. He's a God of truth. He's also a God of judgment. In fact, at the cross, and I've seen the symbol all over the world, the cross equals love, yes, but the cross also equals judgment. The cross wasn't just love. The cross was God judging sin and loving us by sending his son. But one dimension suits us if we can just think, well, God loves me no matter what I do, no matter what I practice, no matter what I think. The church says this, but you know, I know God is love. And so we harp on that and our thinking about God is incorrect. I was reading a wonderful article by a pastor in America. He runs a church there and his name is Pastor Richard Tao. And he recently said this. He says, I don't see much opposition in the days ahead to a generic message that God loves you. Arrogant sinners not only agree with that message, but they cannot imagine a God that does not love them. After all, they love themselves, and what kind of a God wouldn't love them? You see, if you think about God incorrectly, and you carry on in your sin, and you tell yourself it's okay, you can convince yourself of a one-dimensional God. And then you can attack Christians as not being loving, because when they judge, or when they determine other criteria, ah, oh, that's hate speech. No, oh, you're not loving. Jesus was loving. No, God is a God of judgment. That's why he judged Christ on the cross, and he took our sin, because God hates sin. Did you know God is love, but God is also hate? Numerous times in the Bible, it tells us. And here's the thing, God is justice. God is a just judge. Let me remind you, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 27, it says, Zion will be delivered with justice, not with love, with justice. Her penitent ones with righteousness, but rebels and sinners will both be broken and those who forsake the Lord will perish. You see, in contemporary culture, we harp on love, we harp on compassion, and we ignore all the other characteristics of God. And as a Christian, you need to know that God is love, but God is judgment, God is justice, and there's certain things God feels very strongly about. In fact, the Bible uses the word, the fact that God actually hates. Now, here's the thing. Do we celebrate what God hates, or do we think like God and hate what He hates? Because surely if you hate what He hates, you are aligning yourself with him. Sounds radical, eh? Yes, because you just don't hear it today. Everything is about feeling and everything is about compassion. Even in churches today, there's only one emphasis, the grace of God, the grace of God, the grace of God, lest anyone dare feel any bit of condemnation or conviction for their sin. As a result, we've got carnal churches, carnal Christians who are no example to the world and to their children and standards are dropping and dropping we've got to realize that our job is to present the whole character of God. Now, when we talk like this, immediately the social media warriors will jump on this and say, this is hate speech. I want to remind you, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, all scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, is God breathed, comes out of the mouth of God and is useful for, listen, teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. If I as a pastor am training in righteousness, I need to teach all scripture, not just one facet of God's character or one facet of the Bible, lest people get touchy. So if we're training in righteousness, don't say it's hate speech. It's presenting the truth and how we think, how we think about where we come from, how we think about truth, how we think about God. And our thinking about God needs to be correct because your thoughts determine how you live. Now, I read this fascinating book. It's called Don't Burn This Book by David Rubin. He's a homosexual and he's married to a man and he's quite proud of it. But he makes this important statement. And if you're upset today or you feel a little bit touchy, he says this, Part of being a true classical liberal is accepting that many people have fundamental objections to homosexuality because of their religious faith. You might not like their views. Hey, you might even think they're pretty old fashioned, but that's irrelevant. Like you, these people are entitled to their own outlook.
You see, the problem today is people are saying, not that we have differing points of view, they're saying the church shouldn't think a certain way. But we have to think like God thinks. And I want to remind you, there's certain things God hates, God detests. Let me remind you because we're so overbalanced in the area of compassion and love. We've only been given one message. In the book of Revelation, Jesus himself speaks to the church at Ephesus and he talks to them about a group called the Nicolaitans. Let me read it to you from Revelation chapter two. He says, you have this in your favor. You got this on your side. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. You see, God looks at us and says, do you celebrate what I hate or do you hate what I hate? And he says, you got this in you. Jesus is commending people because they have a strong dislike for something that God has a strong dislike for. And he said, well, what were the Nicolaitans? They were people who encouraged people to have sex with people from other religions and other beliefs and to have sex outside of marriage and to ignore God's value system as presented to the children of God. You see, the Lord says, I, I hate that. And the church better get in line with what God hates. Numerous scriptures here, Deuteronomy chapter 12, you must not worship the Lord your God in their way because in worshiping their gods, they do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. What is detestable? It is a intense dislike. So we can't just accommodate things. We've got to hold our thinking to what God thinks. Psalm 5 and verse 5, you hate all who do wrong. You destroy all those who tell lies. Psalm 11 and verse 5, the Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. See, he doesn't feel sorry for them that they're victims of a, of a society. He says, no, you must, you're accountable for your behavior. And I hate that. I dislike it because it goes against my purpose and it goes against my will for the planet. Psalm 97, let those who love the Lord hate evil. Oh, not keep quiet and embrace it. Yeah, we've got to get our thinking in line with God. Exodus chapter 18, in choosing leaders for, for leadership in, in governmental roles. Here Jethro says, select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. Imagine if we had politicians in South Africa who hated dishonest gain. No, we're embracing it. Why? Because, well, you know, we've had a hard time and we've had a bad past. No, we need to start thinking like God thinks. We can't think like the systems of the world. We have to get kingdom thinking if we want to repair our country. Wait, it gets worse. Psalm 119. The, the psalmist says, I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. See, not if you choose every, your own path and you sincere, the Lord says, I will understand that. He says, no, you need to hate every wrong path and you need to choose the right path. Here's another one, Leviticus chapter 18. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. It's pretty clear what God is saying, but we feel and we go by emotion instead of truth. You need to remember in the book of Hebrews, Jesus loved righteousness, it says, and hated wickedness. That's why God had set him above his companions. God found in Jesus someone who hated what he hated and thought like he thought, but also loved the world that he gave up his life. You see, when it comes to holiness, we've lost sight of what holiness is. Holiness means being set apart, not being impure. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says this, that we mustn't be impure, but holy. And anyone who rejects this holiness and, and, and embraces sexual impurity is not disobeying man, but he's disobeying God. You see, holiness is to be set apart, but this is what we say. Oh, we need to fit in with everyone. We need to be like everyone. No, we need to be different. And the Lord says in Leviticus, be holy as I am holy. Be different. Think like me. Separate yourself, even if it costs you friends and it costs you popularity and it costs you criticism. We have to think like God thinks. Let me ask you today, do you celebrate what God hates? And have you got a wrong concept of who God is? You need to think about God like God reveals himself in the word. Number five, we're getting somewhere. We've got a couple of minutes left. Let me go quickly. What do you think about sex and marriage? You see how we think about marriage today is we think marriage is primarily for legal sex. And we make sex the issue in marriage. In fact, it's not. 
The Lord says that he made us male and female. And in the book of Malachi, I don't have time to read it, do your own study, but it tells us that God designed us male and female and he wants faithfulness in marriage. Why? Because he wants godly offspring. He wants us to bring into the earth those that will serve him and honor him. So marriage isn't about our own pleasure and our own happiness. It's about the purposes of God. And then in it, we experience the pleasure of sex and the pleasure of companionship. So now we have redefined marriage, we've redefined sex, we've made our own truth and our thinking is changed. Today people call anything a marriage where two people join together. In fact, it's got to the place where not only is it two people who join together, two people of the same sex, but three people can join together. And we see today that history was made in California in 2017 when three men were, whose names were put on the birth certificate of an adopted child, they call that a marriage, they call that a family. You see, it's how we think today and you can think whatever you like and it's accepted. But a Christian has to think about sex and marriage as God's divine purpose and God's plan. And when you think about it like that, marriage takes on a different role. You don't abandon it quickly and you don't make demands in it and you don't think about it from a sexual point of view. You think about it from a holistic point of view because God intends the family to be the microcosm of society. You see, by calling something a marriage doesn't make it a marriage. Abraham Lincoln famously said one day, if you call a dog's tail a leg, How many legs does it have? And then he answered his own query, four, because calling a tail a leg doesn't make it one. You see, today we think that by just naming something, we can create our own truth, but we have to think kingdom thinking and we have to think about these matters like God does because he wants us to perpetuate a legacy and leave godly offspring on the earth, not alter everything he has said because we are feeling and we've got emotion instead of truth. Number six, what do you think about money, business, and success? You see today, if you think about money, business, and success, it's almost like there's something wrong with you because people who think about money, business, and success are considered bad people. They're the ones who are greedy. They will build big business. They will have more than others. And so we talk about the systems of the world as being preferential to that. We, we, We must share everything out and we must rely on the state to do that. We need to bring in a system that's not biblical where we share everything out and everyone can have a little because no person should have more than another. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches us that we're all different and that no person in one Thessalonians should be dependent on anyone, not on your family, not on your friends, and not on the government. It says we should work so that we're not dependent on anyone, so that we've got something to give, Ephesians says, something to share. So how do you view it? If you view it as evil, if you view it as bad, then you will not want to get ahead in life and you'll feel guilty if you've got more than others. They say poverty causes crime. Oh really? Then affluence causes honesty? No, it doesn't. You see, it doesn't add up. And when you've got wrong thinking, you will draw wrong conclusions and you will advocate wrong systems. I'm amazed today how people have abandoned the biblical view of prosperity and progress and accumulating resources and developing their own family. No, those things are considered almost wrong and success and and, and wealth are, are considered almost evil. And there's this whole thing of trying to redistribute instead of compassion for the poor, concern for one's own family, we're being tainted. And I think it's very important that we realize that at any moment we can improve our lives. We're not bound under a system and we don't need a system to help us live our lives. We can at any time break out and improve our lives. No one is actually bound in poverty. Jim Rohn said this. He says, if you don't like how things are, change it. You're not a tree. In other words, don't just lie there like an inanimate object. He says, start from wherever you are and with whatever you've got. Take initiative. You know the great men who conquered the world, like Alexander the Great 
and, uh, and uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, those two were known for being great. And you know, to be called great is, is, is quite unusual. They were known for being great because they had initiative and wherever they saw obstacles, they conquered it. They didn't look at the odds, they overrode the odds. When they saw an army four times bigger than theirs, they still attacked. And that's the spirit that God has put in human beings. We need to think we can, we can get out of poverty, we can improve our lives. We shouldn't believe that we're victims and that money and prosperity and wealth should be given to us by others. The more you do that, the less motivated you will be and the more you will blame others and complain about your lot in life. If you're a Christian today, you need to go out and have a good spirit and believe God to prosper you because the Bible teaches us that money is not evil, it's just the love of money that is evil. John Wesley, the great preacher said this, he said, do not impute to money the faults of human nature. You see, it's not money that's the problem, it's human beings that are the problem. And to try and make the world all equal and make everyone the same, it's not God's plan. Not even Jesus did that with his 12 disciples. He chose three to be his top three in management. He didn't choose all 12. God discerns that people are different, different capacities, and we need to do the same in viewing money and business and wealth. The late Walter E. Williams, a great thinker and author, he said, prior to capitalism, the way people amassed great wealth was by looting, plundering, and enslaving their fellow man. Capitalism made it possible to become wealthy by serving your fellow man. Doing business, making money, providing goods and services is the way the world is served, the way we progress forward, and so we need to think about it like the Bible does. I've got two minutes. Let me do number seven. And the last one, very quickly, what do you think about the church? You say, man, that's a subject. Wait, I'm not gonna be long. How do you think or what do you think about the church? Do you know that most people, when you talk to them who are outside the church today, if you ask them about the church, you know what they'll say? A standard phrase. This is what they think of the church. It's full of hypocrites. That's why I don't go. How many of you have heard that statement? Many of us. You see, what we say is they say one thing and they don't live up to it. Yes, because Christians are the only ones who can be hypocrites, because Christians are the only ones who make their values and standards public and declare them all the time. This is what God says, this is what God says. And then you can see that they fall short of it because we all fall short of the glory of God. If you're not a Christian, you can't easily be a hypocrite. Remember you Hefner, he wasn't a hypocrite. He lived by his own changing sexual standards all the time. He defined what marriage and sexuality was, published Playboy. He wasn't a hypocrite. He lived up to what he said and he could change it all the time. But you see the church, we have standards that don't change. And then when it shows up that we're not living the ideal, people attack us. But you know what? Everybody's a hypocrite. Parents are hypocrites. They tell their children, don't swear. Then on the road, when someone cuts them off, a swear word comes out, oh, I'm sorry. You see, we all have standards that we fall short of. And the church, because it falls short of its, falls short of its standards, doesn't mean that it should be ignored. I believe this is what people say. I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. And you know what? I can pray on the golf course and I can be a Christian out there. No, you can't. Church isn't about prayer. If you look at our services, you'll see that we only pray for about three, four, five minutes in an hour and a half service. Maybe we pray twice or three times. It's more than prayer, but that's the excuse because if you think of the church as hypocrites, you can excuse yourself from being part of it. People also say the church always judges. They're always judging. Yes, because when you've got standards, you have something to judge by. And so you say, well, you shouldn't preach. No, we preach the ideal, but occasionally we fall short of it. We'd rather have that than have no standards. And it is our role to judge. Let me just tell you this, because people have got such wrong thinking about the church, that's why no one discerns anymore and no one realizes how important it is to analyze everything. As I close today, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 15, the person with the spirit makes judgments. In other words, they evaluate everything against God's truth. It says they make judgments about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. In other words, Christians judge things against truth, but you can't judge them like any old body because it's different. They have standards, they live by the Spirit, but when they fall short, God forgives them and by His grace continues with them 
as his people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 12, it tells us here, what business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? Are you not to judge those inside? So we're meant to uphold standards, judge our own people, uphold standards, and even when we fall short of them, the church is still valuable and it's still God's vehicle for developing people and training in righteousness. You see, if you don't think correctly about the church, you won't join the church, you won't respect the church, and you will excuse yourself from being part of the church. I know many believers who say, I don't go to church anymore because it's all about the money. And look what happened to so-and-so and so-and-so. No, no, no. You need to be part of it because all of us basically are hypocrites because we fall short of God's standards. As I close today, let's not forget. And, and let me ask you this question. What do you think about Jesus? Because it's because of Jesus Christ that our sin and our falling short has been covered. And when you think of Jesus as savior, he's not just a teacher. He's not just someone who deserves respect. No, no, he's someone who needs to be embraced. Why? Because all of us fall short of what God requires and all of us need to be saved and brought into God's church and trained in righteousness. Do you ignore Jesus today? Do you not even give him a thought? Or do you think, oh, he's worthy of respect, a good religious leader? Or do you embrace him today? Because when you really think and you really know who Jesus is, you will embrace him and he will change your life and you will be born again. I'm gonna close now and pray. And I hope you've enjoyed the word, you've been challenged. It's so important, what do you see? What do you think? And as I pray today, I wanna to ask you, what do you think about Jesus? Do you think he's worthy of being received as Lord and Savior? He came into the world not to teach, but to die for your sin and my sin. And it's not automatic that our sin is taken away. We have to receive him today. Do you know that? Have you, have you thought that? Have you realized that? If today you say, I realize it, while well, your thinking is correct, and if you invite him into your life, you can be transformed, born again, and made part of God's church and forgiven your sin. If you'd like to do that, I want you to pray with me right now and follow this prayer on the screen as I pray. Father, I thank you today for Jesus Christ, who died for our sins as our Savior. I believe in him today. And I don't just think of him with respect. I don't ignore him, but I embrace him as my Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sin and make me a child of God. I commit to follow you and to serve you and to grow in the knowledge of God. Help me, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a short prayer and a simple prayer, but it's a decision. You see, when you think right, you make a decision. And when you make a decision, God starts to work. And if you go onto our website, click on the salvation button or scan this QR code, you'll be able to make a journey with God. You'll be able to walk with Him and grow in Him because our thinking needs to be renewed. Romans chapter 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the renewing of your thinking so you can think like God thinks. Well, that's it for today. And before I go, let me remind you, Pastor Jonathan Fontana Rosa from Edge Church in Australia, wonderful young man running fantastic campuses in Australia. I often speak there. He will be online with us next week. Some of our campuses are opened, uh, but we are still online. So if you can't get to a campus, you can watch online. You can enjoy Pastor Jonathan Fontana Rosa, wonderful man from Australia, godly man who's going to preach the word. Don't miss it. Invite someone. Thank you.